I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University. I'm delighted to welcome you to this webinar presented by the university's volunteer groups, the Rockefeller University Council, the Committee on Trust and Estate Gift Plans, and the Women in Science and Parents in Science initiatives. Our speaker today is Dr. Paul Cohen, whose talk bears the intriguing title, A Burning Question, Can Some Body Fat Keep You Thin? Each fall, we invite our benefactors and friends to join us on campus to hear about the transformative research underway in our 70 laboratories. This program continues that tradition, but in the virtual setting of a Zoom webinar, the format that we've all had to embrace in our efforts to socially distance and remain safe in the face of the global pandemic. Before I introduce Paul, I'd like to say a few words about the university and COVID-19. At nearly 120 years old, Rockefeller is one of the world's premier biomedical research institutions. Our credo is science for the benefit of humanity. So what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, Rockefeller laboratories conduct great basic research to better understand the essential processes of life, health, and disease. The university's discoveries enrich human knowledge and also create new opportunities to treat, prevent, and eradicate a range of human illnesses. A perfect example of this is the work of Dr. Charles Rice, the Maurice and Corinne P. Greenberg Professor in Virology and Head of the Laboratory of Virology and Infectious Disease. Last Monday, we awoke on campus to the incredible news that Charlie had been awarded the 2020 Nobel Prize in Medicine for his pioneering work on the discovery of the hepatitis C virus. When I was in clinical training in the 1980s, we knew about three common causes of liver failure and death. The hepatitis A and B viruses, along with chronic alcohol abuse, were recognized to cause progressive severe liver damage leading to death. Nonetheless, at that time, nearly half the people with progressive liver disease were not explained by these causes. In the 1970s, Harvey Alter provided evidence that one or more viruses were likely the culprits. And in 1989, Michael Houghton identified the hepatitis C virus, which accounts for virtually all of the remaining causes of viral hepatitis. But for the next seven years, global efforts failed in efforts to use this viral RNA to infect cells or cause hepatitis in animal models. Charlie, having spent his career to that point doing basic science on related viruses, turned his attention to the hepatitis C virus and quickly deduced that the known viral genome was missing a critical sequence at its end that's required for the initiation of viral replication. In short order, he identified the missing element, made RNA that included the missing piece, and showed that this RNA molecule could infect cells and animals and cause disease and produce new infectious virus, thus showing that this viral sequence was sufficient to transmit hepatitis. This discovery paved the way to perform high throughput screens for novel therapeutics that could arrest viral replication, resulting in development of drugs that target viral proteins. Today, a combination of these drugs can quickly and safely cure nearly all patients with chronic hepatitis C infection, which includes 71 million people worldwide. This extraordinary advance has already saved several million lives and will save millions more in the coming years. The World Health Organization is aiming to treat at least 80% of the world's population with chronic infection over the next 10 years. Charlie's work is incredible testimony to the power of basic science to be used to prevent needless suffering and death. Charlie is the 26th Rockefeller faculty member to have received the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine or chemistry, during, uh, including six in the last 21 years. Additionally, 24 Rockefeller scientists, including Ch Charlie, have received Lasker Awards. This is a remarkable record of achievement. Charlie is also an exemplar of the 25 Rockefeller scientists who, in March, quickly pivoted their research programs to take up the scientific battle against COVID-19 with a goal to improve the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of COVID-19. Their accomplishments have been remarkable. Charlie's own work has identified host genes required by the virus for its propagation. Another excellent example is the work of the lab of Jean-Laurent Casanova, he and his colleagues just published two remarkable papers back to back in the journal Science that shows how gene mutations and acquired antibodies can explain why some people progress to severe, potentially fatal disease after infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, while most do not. 
And Michelle Nussenzweig has discovered highly potent and long-lasting monoclonal antibodies that can prevent the virus from infecting cells and non-human primates. These antibodies are going into human trials in early December. Some of you may have heard Drs. Rice, Casanova, and Nussenzweig report on their COVID-19 work this past spring and summer in our Virtual Discussions with Genuine Experts webinar series. Our next session will be held at this time next week on Tuesday, October 20th, when Jean-Laurent Casanova will tell us the compelling story of his discovery and its potential to impact diagnostics and therapeutics. I hope you'll be able to join us then and that you'll also mark your calendars for Thursday, December 10th, when Michel Nussenzweig will give us an update on his work using antibodies to prevent and treat COVID-19. Videos from our past programs and more information about these upcoming events can be found on our website. Well, Rockefeller has been through many epidemics and pandemics since uh, our founding. The, wor the work now underway is very much in keeping with our cherished tradition of service to humankind. I want to thank, I want to take this opportunity to thank the many members of this audience who have contributed generously to our Fund for COVID-19 research and who have been steadfast in their annual support of the university. Your philanthropic support is essential to our scientists as they pursue groundbreaking discoveries in a wide range of fields. So while we confront the immediate challenges of the pandemic, the vital ongoing work in our laboratories in other areas also continues, such as that of today's speaker, physician scientist Paul Cohen. Paul's work is aimed at understanding the biology of fat cells and the role they play in health and disease. He focuses on cardiovascular disease and other complications associated with obesity. He is also interested in metabolic and molecular factors that may help explain why obesity does not cause illness in everyone. Obesity is estimated to affect more than a third of adults and nearly 20% of children and adolescents in the United States and is associated with outcomes such as hypertension, type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, and many types of cancer. While these associations are well documented, many fundamental questions about the biology underlying body weight and health remain unanswered. Paul is seeking explanations through research on the specialized oh. adipose tissue yeah. known as brown fat, which breaks yeah, down blood sugar and fat molecules to generate heat and maintain body temperature. Long known to be important in hibernating mammals and human infants, metabolically active brown fat was identified in adult humans about 10 years ago. Paul and his colleagues are now using molecular biology and other approaches to understand the health protective effects of brown fat. Their goal is to develop therapies that can bring its benefits, including lowered risk of diabetes and heart disease, to people in need. Paul is the Albert Resnick MD Assistant Professor and Head of the Laboratory of Molecular Metabolism at Rockefeller and Senior Attending Physician at the Rockefeller University Hospital. He also has the distinction of being a Rockefeller University alumnus, having earned his MD and PhD degrees through the Tri-Institutional Medical Scientist Training Program that Rockefeller co-sponsors with Weill Cornell Medical College and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. He did his PhD thesis with Rockefeller Head of Laboratory and Lasker Award winner Jeff Friedman. Following his residency in internal medicine at Columbia and his cardiology fellowship at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Paul joined the lab of Bruce Spiegelman at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in 2009 as a postdoctoral fellow. And in 2015, he was recruited back to Rockefeller to start his lab and begin the studies that you will hear about today. We will now hear Paul discuss his current research, after which we will answer questions from the audience. You're welcome to submit questions at any time during the talk by typing them into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Paul, it's now my pleasure to turn the screen over to you. Thank you for that kind introduction, Rick. I'm really pleased to be here with all of you today. Obesity represents one of the most urgent threats to public health today. Just to give you a sense of the numbers, in the United States, more than one in three adults are now obese, and two in three adults are either overweight or obese. Moreover, nearly 20% of children are obese. Unfortunately, these trends are getting worse. By 2030, it's estimated that exactly 50% of adults in the United States will be predicted to be obese. This health problem is uh, costing our healthcare system an enormous amount of money currently estimated at $150 billion per year. And obesity is also overtaking tobacco as the leading preventable cause of cancer. Quite topical for our current 
uh, situation, obesity, as we are learning, is also a major risk factor for adverse outcomes in COVID-19. And lastly, this is no longer just a problem of the United States or of industrialized nations. Uh, over 2 billion adults worldwide are now either overweight or obese. And for the first time in our history as humans, diseases due to overnutrition are now more prevalent than diseases due to undernutrition. So just to put a human picture on these alarming statistics, I'd like to share with you a clinical case of a patient that I took care of that illustrates uh, some of the myriad problems that can be associated with obesity. So this was a 44-year-old man with obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and coronary artery disease. I first came to know him uh, when I was on call one evening, and I received uh, the following uh, statement from him. My wife thinks I'm having chest pain, and then he paused and said, but I feel fine. I've later learned that this is an extremely concerning statement and almost always means something seriously wrong is happening. And sure enough, he presented to the emergency room a few hours later and was found to have a heart attack and ultimately required urgent coronary artery bypass surgery. In the operating room, in addition to his coronary disease, he was found to have a mass in his chest, which ultimately led to a diagnosis of lymphoma. So after recovering from his bypass surgery, he received chemotherapy, which was unfortunately complicated by cardiotoxicity. A couple of years later, having recovered from his cardiac surgery and his lymphoma treatment, unfortunately, he was found to have a new mass in his kidney, which was diagnosed as renal cell carcinoma. And then over the next few years, he had multiple episodes of recurrent chest pain requiring coronary stenting and was also diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. I would argue that the fundamental underlying problem in this patient is shown here with a height of five foot seven and a weight of 270 pounds, his body mass index, which is a commonly used metric, um, indicates that he's in the severely obese category. So obesity by definition is defined by an excess of fat or adipose tissue. And humans and mammals tend to store fat in a variety of locations or depots, which are shown in this slide here. So these locations can be broadly divided into either subcutaneous locations or below the skin or visceral locations around the internal organs. And a number of studies indicate that it's the location of fat more so than the quantity of fat that is a key predictor of obesity associated diseases with fat around the internal organs being especially pathogenic. So you might ask with all of these health problems associated with obesity and excess adipose tissue, why do we even have adipose tissue? And I think that can be best explained by this example here. So for most of our evolutionary history as humans, we face the same predicament as this bear here. And that was a cycle of feasts or famine where it was never really clear when the next meal was coming. And so adipose tissue or fat evolved as a site to store these excess calories, which could then be mobilized in times of need. So shown here is a picture of the same bear taken either uh, just after awakening from hibernation and you see a nice lean bear or just before going into hibernation. And these bears can pack on hundreds of excess pounds which are stored in adipose tissue, which then allow them to sustain vital functions during hibernation. And the main functional unit of this fat tissue or adipose tissue is the adipocyte or fat cell. And I'm showing you two different visualizations of these cells. In the picture on the left, you can see a fat cell with the nucleus, which contains the DNA and genetic information, squashed all the way to the side of the cell. And the great, great majority of the cell is made up of this yellow droplet, which contains lipid, the main storage currency of energy in fat cells. And on the right is an electron micrograph showing how these fat cells are organized in fat tissue in a matrix of connective tissue. So what I'd like to uh, bring up today is the notion that while fat is clearly part of the problem, might it also be part of the solution? And to introduce you to that, I'd like to tell you about two different kinds of fat cells. So thus far, uh, I've been referring to white fat as shown on the left. And this is the kind of fat that tends to expand in the setting of obesity. And these cells, as you can see here, have these large lipid droplets, which are there to store excess energy and have very few mitochondria, these bean-shaped organelles that are the main engine of the cell. But mammals also contain another kind of fat cell called a brown fat cell, which is shown on the right. 
these fat cells have numerous small lipid droplets, but a very, very large number of mitochondria, these engines or powerhouses of the cell. And in fact, it's the iron in the mitochondria that literally gives tissues containing these cells a brown color. And unlike white fat cells, which very efficiently store excess energy, brown fat cells do the opposite. They dissipate or convert energy into heat. So this just highlights the complex biochemical pathway through which these cells generate heat. This is a rendition of the mitochondria, and normally these chemical reactions result in the production of ATP, the main storage unit of energy. What is unique about brown fat cells, though, is that they express a protein called UCP1, or uncoupling protein 1, which short circuits this process such that rather than being channeled into the production of ATP or energy, that energy is instead burned off or dissipated as heat. So why do we have brown fat? It's likely that brown fat evolved to protect newborns from hypothermia, one of the major threats to life. And in fact, um, we are born with preformed brown fat, which can generate heat, and therefore it's also referred to as thermogenic or heat generating fat. So what you can see in the figure on the left is a group of newborn mice that are imaged with a thermal camera which detects heat. And on the top, you can see a group of young newborn mice all huddled together. And one of these newborn mice has wandered off from his brethren to explore the cage. And what I hope you can appreciate as highlighted by the letter D is this area in between the shoulders or in the interscapular location that is emitting a large amount of heat as detected by thermal imaging. And this, in fact, is brown fat. Newborn humans also have this tissue, which is shown in this cartoon here, mainly located along the neck and cervical spine. In addition to developmentally preformed brown fat, mammals also contain an inducible kind of brown fat that can also help animals survive in the cold. And so bears, uh, to come back to our earlier example, have inducible brown fat that allows them to maintain their body temperature during the time when they're hibernating and not moving or eating. Mice also have this inducible brown fat, as do humans. And this um, picture depicts that inducible brown fat in rodents. So mice can live very happily at six degrees for an indefinite period of time. And what you can see here is a dissection just showing the adipose tissues in a mouse that either lives at 28 degrees, which is a comfortable uh, thermoneutral temperature for rodents, or at six degrees. And on the top, you can see the preformed brown fat. But what I hope you can appreciate is this tremendous transformation where now these tissues have gone from a whitish appearance to a brownish appearance, indicating the activation of these inducible brown fat cells. So the key molecular switch that controls these cells is a molecule called PRDM16. And in work done by us and others, we've shown that PRDM16 is required for the function of these thermogenic fat cells. And it acts as a transcriptional regulator to bind other proteins in DNA. And in so doing, it turns on genes required for brown fat function, while at the same time turning off genes instrumental in white fat function. Now, thermogenic brown fat is not just a bag of fat cells, but what you can see here in this 3D imaging approach that we developed is it's actually a rather intricate tissue. So this is fat from a mouse either housed at room temperature or for 48 hours or one week in the cold. And what you can appreciate uh, as shown in magenta are these UCP1 positive or heat generating fat cells. And you can see this tremendous expansion of these cells as the animals adapt to living in the cold. And this tissue also consists of a variety of other cell types. And in work that we and others have done, we've defined an important role for sympathetic nerves in controlling the function of this tissue. And this 3D image just allows you to visualize the sympathetic nervous system entering adipose tissue and supplying each of these individual brown fat cells. So much of our understanding of this type of fat tissue has come from studying mouse models. And we've studied two different mouse models. One that lacks this key molecule, PRDM16, and with that, these animals lack thermogenic fat. And with that, they develop many of the features of human metabolic syndrome, where they have obesity, increased inflammation, insulin resistance, and fatty liver disease. There's also a mouse model that has increased levels of PRDM16 in its fat tissues, and these mice have enhanced function of thermogenic brown fat, and they demonstrate protection from obesity and its sequelae. 
So these models and the striking observations I've illustrated so far raise the notion of whether it might be possible to target this fat for therapeutic benefit. So if we're going to do that, it's important to think about obesity, which quite simply uh, develops due to a chronic imbalance between energy intake and energy expenditure. And most therapeutics for obesity thus far have focused on the energy intake side. Now, if we were able to increase the amounts or activity of this brown fat, we would predict that perhaps this might lead to an increase in energy expenditure, loss of body weight, and protection from some of the complications associated with obesity. However, uh, conventional notions actually suggest that this will not or should not work. And the reason for that is that until quite recently, it was thought that brown fat was a tissue that was really only relevant in newborn uh, rodents and humans and mammals as a way to defend against hypothermia. So what you can see on the far left is a newborn mouse. And like humans, mice tend to be born uh, hairless and they have a fairly large body surface area. And so hypothermia represents a major threat to life. And the presence of this tissue allows animals to defend and maintain their body temperature. And for a long time, it was thought that like the thymus, this was a tissue that atrophied or went away uh, as an animal progressed to adulthood. However, in the past 10 to 20 years, we've come to realize that this is actually not the case. So really, in my mind, this field started with a paper that did not get a lot of attention in the radiology literature in 2003. So what I'm showing you here is an FDG PET scan, which is a scan that is commonly used in the diagnosis of cancer or to track cancer progression. And the way that these scans work is that patients are injected with a radio labeled form of glucose, and then glucose uptake is imaged on both a PET scan and a CT scan is done to overlay with that. And so tissues that are highly metabolically active will take up an increased amount of glucose. And typically that highlights the presence of tumors. What was found in this paper was that many patients undergoing PET scans had bilateral symmetrical uptake of glucose in these tissues along the neck, shown in A and B. And this tissue was initially referred to as USA fat, or upper supraclavicular fat, because it had increased glucose uptake, and on CT scan had the density characteristics of fat tissue. But it wasn't until 2009 that people began to appreciate that this was in fact brown fat and that it was cold inducible and that it might have some importance in human physiology. And so there were three papers published uh, back to back to back that highlighted this discovery. And shown here is an image from one of these studies in which a young healthy subject underwent a PET CT scan either at thermoneutral conditions or after just a few hours of cold exposure. And what I think you can appreciate is that there is now with cold exposure, the appearance of these tissues along the neck and cervical spine. And some of these subjects were brave enough to allow researchers to biopsy these tissues. And when they looked at these tissues under a microscope, they had the characteristics of brown adipose tissue and expressed markers characteristic of brown adipose tissue. So, over the past 10 years, this is quite a young field. A large amount of studies have been done to in, uh, investigate the role of brown fat in disease in both mouse models and humans. And the work in humans has really lagged behind because it is quite cumbersome to do PET scans on people for research purposes. This is a scan that requires an IV to be established. It requires exposure to radiation. And so most of the studies that have been done until recently involve just a small number of healthy subjects. And so what we decided to do, which is highlighted in this slide, is to try and look in a larger setting. And we took advantage of the fact that we're right across the road from Sloan Kettering, which is a major cancer center. And they do about 20,000 PET scans a year to either diagnose cancer or track its progression. And so working with colleagues there, we did a retrospective review of a decade's worth of these PET scans to look for the presence or absence of brown fat. Fortunately, they always comment on the presence of brown fat in their reports because otherwise this tissue could be misconstrued as highlighting the presence of a tumor. And so we reviewed about 50,000 different patient studies. And I just want to summarize here some of the initial findings. So first of all, we found that the presence of brown fat was more common in women than in men. The presence of brown fat decreases with age. 
It's also inversely associated with outdoor temperature, meaning that scans done in cold winter months are more likely to identify brown fat than scans done in warm summer months. And lastly, brown fat seems to be less common in individuals who are overweight and obese. And whether that's cause or consequence, we don't know. And these four variables that we identified had all been seen in other smaller studies. And so what this allowed us to do was to now take our large patient cohort and to link the presence or absence of brown fat to all of the data in these patients' charts. And this is a summary of one of the key findings here. So on the left of the line are odds ratios that indicate a benefit associated with brown fat. And on the right of the line would be things that might indicate harm associated with brown fat. And these are all common metabolic or cardiovascular diseases. And what I think you can appreciate in red is that nearly all of these diseases have a significantly lower odds in individuals who had brown fat detected on their PET scan. Particularly striking is type 2 diabetes, where the odds ratio is less than half that of those without brown fat. And this is even after matching for these other variables of age, gender, outdoor temperature, and body mass index. So these are all new associations, and it really expands the scope of brown fat beyond just simply a tissue that dissipates energy and might promote weight loss to a tissue that might actually be associated with protection from these serious chronic diseases. We also looked at our subjects where we broke them down into categories by body mass index, less than 25 or normal weight, between 25 and 30 or overweight, or greater than 30, which is obese. And individuals with brown fat are shown in brown and those without brown fat are shown in blue. And what you can appreciate, I'm just highlighting three common conditions, is that for each body mass index category, individuals with brown fat have a significant reduction in the prevalence of these diseases. You can see, for example, for type 2 diabetes that the prevalence of type 2 diabetes goes up with increasing body weight, as expected, whereas those with brown fat seem to show protection. I also want to point out that even in individuals with a body mass index of less than 25, these would be individuals with normal body weight, the presence of brown fat is associated with significantly reduced prevalence of type 2 diabetes, dyslipidemia, and coronary artery disease, among a number of other chronic conditions. So what explains the benefits associated with brown fat? And that's something we're actively working on. Um, might it just be due to the increased energy expenditure mediated by this tissue? We think that's part of the story, but that it doesn't explain the whole story. Two things that we're currently investigating in my lab are possible secondary effects on white fat, meaning that individuals with brown fat may actually have less of this unhealthy or harmful visceral fat and more of the beneficial subcutaneous fat. We've also become very interested in the endocrine properties of these cells. So in addition to regulating energy balance, these cells secrete a wide variety of metabolites and hormones that can signal to local tissues or distant tissues to regulate metabolism. So if we think about therapies, it turns out actually that nearly 100 years ago, there was a therapy that in hindsight actually does activate brown fat. And I just want to talk about that for a minute because it's an interesting, albeit cautionary tale. So dinitrophenol is a compound that was studied here in the 1930s as a drug that increases metabolic rate and is associated with profound weight loss. So in this study, you can see that over about 80 days, this person's body weight went down from about 210 pounds to around 190 pounds, which is far more effective than any weight loss therapeutic we currently have available. However, um, the story behind dinitrophenol is quite interesting, uh, but also raises caution. So dinitrophenol was first identified because it's an ingredient in munitions. And around World War I, uh, it was found that people working in munitions factories who were exposed to dinitrophenol were complaining of feeling hot all the time and tended to lose weight. In the 1930s, more than 100,000 people took dinitrophenol for weight loss, and in general, they could lose about three pounds per week on the higher dose of the drug. But unfortunately, a number of toxicities, including fevers and deaths, occurred, and so in 1938, uh, dinitrophenol was made illegal to purchase. It wasn't until 1961 that work from Peter Mitchell, who won the Nobel Prize for this work, established that dinitrophenol acts as a mitochondrial uncoupler. 
meaning it makes mitochondria in all cells do what brown fat does, which is to, instead of uh, taking energy into ATP, uh, convert it into heat. And so while modified forms of dinitrophenol are currently under investigation, this does not seem to be the right way to target this problem. So what about current therapeutic targets? Might we have any better luck? So the most well-established way to activate brown fat in rodents and in human studies is with cold exposure. And it's actually only modest cold exposure around about 60 to 64 degrees Fahrenheit that seems to be enough to activate brown fat over a few hours. Most people though do not relish the idea of cold exposure as a treatment for their ailments. So what about other possibilities? Uh, in rodents, aerobic exercise or increased physical activity has also been shown to increase the activity of brown fat. Um, this may well hold promise in humans, but studies linking exercise to brown fat activation in humans have not yet been performed. A common question comes up about diet. Are there any things in our diet that might either increase or decrease the activity of our brown fat? And thus far, this is really a black box. Uh, there's really a dearth of research in this area and it's, it's an unmet need. Uh, in terms of targeted therapies, the most promising drug is one called Mirabivron, which is a drug that's already on the market to treat overactive bladder. And it binds to a molecule called the beta-3 adrenergic receptor. And it turns out that two places in the body that express high levels of the beta-3 adrenergic receptor are the bladder and brown fat. And so this drug in humans is capable of activating brown fat. However, at the doses required to activate brown fat, it also has off-target effects leading to increased heart rate and blood pressure in many patients, which likely make it a deal breaker for widespread use for obesity and metabolic diseases. So where I think this field is probably going to go is to the two latter points. So one would be repurposed drugs. And what I mean by that is drugs that are already on the market for other purposes that may have the unintended consequence of activating brown fat. And something we're very excited about with our large cohort of 50,000 plus patients is that we now have the ability to look at all of the data in their clinical charts, including which uh, medications they're taking, which doses of medications, to see if we can identify any drugs that might be associated with increased prevalence of brown fat. And that would be the starting point for studies in cells and animals to see if those drugs did in fact activate brown fat. And then the last, which I'll talk about in the last few minutes, is the idea of mechanism-based targets. So to identify mechanism-based targets, what we'd really like to know is what determines brown fat activity. Do we all have brown fat? or do some people have more than others? In the study that we performed, I told you that roughly 10% of individuals had brown fat, but it's important to recognize that those were not stimulated scans, so people had not been exposed to the cold. In other studies, when people are stimulated with cold exposure, close to 100% of people have brown fat. So we think the question is not so much who has brown fat, but what control is the amount or activity of brown fat. So the reason I'm showing you this individual here uh, named Wim Hof or the Iceman uh, will become apparent in a moment. So he holds uh, many endurance records for cold exposure. And his hobby is to spend very long periods of time in the cold. And he's developed this technique that he believes allows him to tolerate prolonged cold exposure. So he's been studied by colleagues in the Netherlands, and he has a significantly increased amount of brown fat relative to men of his age. That in and of itself is not surprising because he spends a great deal of time outdoors in the cold. But this man also has an identical twin brother who's shown here in the picture to the right, and he does not share this hobby, but he's been studied and he also has a significantly increased amount of brown fat. So this example with these twins at least highlights the possibility that there could be genetic determinants that might be associated with increased brown fat activity. And so that's uh, an idea that we're exploring further through a variety of different approaches. So we're taking a multi-pronged approach. On the first, we've gone back to our large human cohort and we've quantified brown fat in thousands of these individuals. And what you can see in this scatter plot is the distribution of brown fat by age category. As I told you, brown fat tends to go down as people get older. 
But in red, what you can see is that for each age category, there are a number of individuals who have significantly more brown fat than their age matched and gender matched cohort. And we think it's possible that these exceptional variants may provide an opportunity to identify genetic variants associated with increased brown fat. We're also taking a number of approaches highlighted on the right where we are leveraging existing human cohorts that have had their genome sequenced. These are cohorts either with obesity uh, or individuals who are thin but otherwise healthy and we can then look at those variants and see if we can identify any variants that might regulate the function of brown fat. And once we identify those variants, we have the ability then to not only look at what those variants are associated with in our large clinical cohorts, but to also study those variants in cells and in animal models. And we think that might represent the starting point of a therapeutic approach to target brown fat. So in summary, what I've told you about today is work uh, highlighting that white and brown fat allow us to survive key life challenges with white fat providing the opportunity to survive periods of feast and famine and brown fat allowing us to tolerate cold. Our modern lifestyle, however, is rather different from that of our evolutionary ancestors. And so now in an environment with abundant energy dense food, sedentary status and thermal comfort, that has contributed to an overexpansion of white fat and a decrease in brown fat, which play a large role in the predicament we now find ourselves in. However, brown fat is associated with protection from obesity and cardiometabolic diseases, and we believe that a deeper understanding of the biology of this tissue may provide new therapeutic targets to address obesity and associated diseases. So in closing, I'd like to thank all of the people from my lab, past and present, who've done this work. I'd also like to thank our collaborators, the wonderful resource centers at Rockefeller, including the Rockefeller University Hospital and other resource centers that played an instrumental role in this work and in ongoing work, and our support, which was instrumental in allowing us to proceed proceed to these uh, ambitious studies. And above is, is a um, picture of my lab uh, pre-COVID uh, at a celebration at a restaurant in Chinatown. And I hope we'll all get back to this uh, point sometime soon. Thank you all for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for that terrific presentation. And now we will uh, ask and uh, answer some of the excellent questions that uh, have come in during the seminar and uh, were sent in as well uh, before the seminar. Paul, one question that has come in is, uh, are there humans who don't have uh, any brown fat or does everyone have the depot and it's just a matter of uh, stimulating it? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, we think that all humans, or at least most humans, do actually have brown fat, um, and that it's a matter of the amount or the activity. But I do want to note that we're dealing with an imprecise form of measurement. So right now, our gold standard for detecting brown fat is an FDG PET scan, which measures the uptake of radio labeled glucose. Uh, in addition to using glucose as a fuel source, though, brown fat has a variety of other fuel sources for which there aren't readily available tests to measure their um, uptake. And so if we had a better imaging test, we may be able to identify brown fat in more individuals. But what the field really needs is a biomarker or cheap non-invasive test, which would allow us to screen a large number of individuals and document the presence or absence of brown fat as well as its quantity. Do you imagine that if you uh, studied people at the extremes of environmental exposure, uh, that you might find that there's strong selection for higher levels of brown fat in uh, cold environments, and you might be completely tolerant to having no brown fat uh, in uh, extremely warm environments? Um, that's certainly a possibility, and it's something we have considered. Um, about a decade or so ago, the Inuit genome was published, and we were interested in taking a look at that. We did not find any variants in genes linked to brown fat function, at least not obviously linked. Um, on the opposite side, though, um, population studies have shown that um, individuals in Southeast Asia, for example, which is a relatively warmer environment, tend to have lower amounts of brown fat. And so whether that's genetics or environment or some combination of the two, we can't say. 
Another question that's come in is, uh, are there systematic changes in the levels of brown fat uh, as we age? Uh, there are. So studies uh, indicate that the amount and activity of brown fat tends to peak uh, in the teenage years or young adulthood and then go down with each successive decade of life. Uh, there are a number of individuals who remain, uh, who retain high brown fat activity even with age, but in general it does go down with age. You showed in the really impressive uh, data from uh, the scans that uh, you reviewed the striking correlation with uh, of higher levels of brown fat with decreased risk of uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, and high cholesterol. How about with the uh, body mass index itself? Um, so in that particular study, we wanted to control for body mass index because we know that all of those conditions are also associated with obesity or body mass index. And so we controlled for body mass index. So this protection is independent of body weight. Um, in work that we have ongoing now, what we've done is we've used these CT scans to actually quantify the amount and location of fat. And what is emerging thus far is that it looks like individuals with brown fat tend to have less of this visceral or unhealthy white fat and more subcutaneous fat. And so this shift in fat distribution may explain uh, one way in which brown fat conveys its benefits. Well, on that topic, is, is it clear why visceral fat is more dangerous, if you will, than uh, peripheral fat? Yeah, so that's a very widely discussed question and something that we're also actively investigating in my lab. I think there are probably a few reasons. Um, one of them is that we weren't necessarily designed to have a lot of visceral fat. So subcutaneous fat and brown fat are present at birth, but visceral fat only really tends to appear around the time of puberty. And it's thought that visceral fat acts as a buffer to protect internal organs from excess calories, and perhaps small amounts of visceral fat are beneficial. But in our current environment, when visceral fat expands, the ability of these cells to store excess nutrients is exceeded, and so that then leads to cell death, inflammation, and a, a whole process that contributes to insulin resistance and some of these other diseases. A question from one of the cognizanti in the audience has uh, asked, uh, have you tried a small molecule approach to increase PR, PRDM16 activity? Yeah. Might explain the story for the, uh, uh, the non-cognizanti in the audience. Sure, absolutely. So um, PRDM16 is this key molecular switch that controls the development and function of brown fat. And so what I believe the question is asking is, have we done a screen in which we take a library of thousands of small molecules, both known drugs, natural products, uh, and other compounds to see if we can identify compounds that regulate PRDM16? Uh, so yes, we have done that. Um, our initial screen though, however, was based on measuring uh, or looking for compounds that can increase RNA levels or gene levels of PRDM16. But what we're now learning is that PRDM16 is mainly controlled at the protein level with modifications of the protein. And so we think that the correct small molecule screen, which we hope to do, is to identify those key modifications and then identify drugs that might manipulate or modulate those modifications. A question that has come in is, uh, how many calories does uh, brown fat burn when it's uh, induced? And how much, uh, you know, what would be an optimal uh, uh, weight loss approach if you were trying to reduce weight through the brown fat mechanism? Yeah, so also a great question and one that is widely asked. Uh, a number of studies have made estimates, and I, I should tell you before I give you the numbers that the numbers vary widely across studies. But on the high end, people estimate that brown fat can contribute to up to 20% of calories burned in an individual. So it could be a substantial amount of calories. Um, however, um, whether that's actually true, and if it's true in all people or just exceptional people, we don't know. The other thing to highlight, as I indicated on this scale uh, showing energy in and energy out, 
is that in rodents at least, we know that when we activate brown fat by exposing them to cold, for example, uh, the rodents will eat more. So they need to balance that energy out with more energy in. And so they don't actually lose weight. And so in my estimation, I think that the benefits of brown fat will not so much be for weight loss as it will be for protecting against some of the diseases that come along with obesity. Another question that's come in is uh, whether there's ethnic variation in uh, levels of brown fat, and does that explain uh, cardio any of the cardiometabolic uh, risk variation? Yes. So uh, unfortunately, this is a problem with a lot of biomedical research where um, diverse racial and ethnic groups just haven't been as deeply studied as they ought to be. I mentioned earlier there is one study in Southeast Asians showing that there is a decrease in brown fat relative to Caucasians. This is a very small study, though, of less than 100 people. In our large clinical cohort of 50,000 plus patients, we do have patients self-identified um, race and ethnicity. And so that has allowed us to look for any differences. And thus far, we do not see any differences However, in the population that we studied, the number of patients who were not white was rather small. And so I think what this highlights is that we really need to do these studies in a variety of populations to answer that question. And it may well be that there are differences. Moving uh, a bit away from uh, brown fat, uh, but uh, a topic of the day is uh, how does obesity contribute to adverse uh, outcome with uh, COVID-19? Yeah, so great question. I, I wish I had an answer to that right now. I, I think it's, it's a striking clinical association and I can share with you at least some possibilities. So one kind of obvious possibility is, as I told you at the beginning, obesity increases the risk for a whole number of metabolic complications, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and these uh, conditions are also risk factors for adverse prognosis from COVID-19. I think the other two key factors is that obesity is associated with increased thrombotic risk or increased risk for blood clots. And we now appreciate that some of the severe complications of COVID-19 involve this syndrome of blood clots and strokes. And then lastly, um, it's been shown in animal models and humans that obesity perturbs immune function. And so people who are obese may have impaired or defective uh, immune responses that might make them more susceptible to more severe forms of this infection. Uh, along the, the same lines, uh, there's a, a question about the location of uh, body fat and the, the role of uh, being uh, pear-shaped or apple-shaped. And uh, what's, uh, what's your view on the importance of uh, the location of, uh, per, of fat distribution? Yes, so also a, a great question. Um, the location where excess fat is stored is a really, really important determinant of uh, morbidity in the setting of obesity. Um, so visceral fat or apple-shaped obesity is associated with increased risk of diabetes, heart disease, uh, and even death relative to an equivalent amount of excess subcutaneous or pear-shaped obesity. So it's really the quality more so than the quantity of the fat that matters. And there was a study published in the British Medical Journal about a week ago that was reported on in the New York Times that did a meta-analysis of more than 60 different studies looking at body fat distribution and health outcomes. And they saw in this very large study, once again, that increased visceral fat is a risk factor for death. And we now appreciate at the more basic side that the reason for that is because visceral and subcutaneous fat are inherently different tissues and cell types. It used to be thought that fat was fat, but we now appreciate that visceral and subcutaneous fat uh, cells come from different uh, developmental lineages, they express different gene programs, and they have a very different physiology. So there's a lot of interest in uh, bariatric surgery for extreme obesity and the sometimes dramatic effects on uh, uh, weight loss uh, that results very rapidly and, and reduction in uh, need for insulin that happens before there's been uh, a lot of weight loss. Do you have 
thoughts about uh, what what's uh, what is bariatric surgery doing other than preventing uh, caloric ingestion? Yes, yes. So that's something that we also have been investigating, and so. We and others have shown in mouse models that early after bariatric surgery, uh, one of the things that happens is you see increased activation of brown fat. How that's happening, we don't know, but that raises the possibility that some of the early benefits of bariatric surgery may be mediated by brown fat. So we're now working with a collaborator who has great expertise as a mouse bariatric surgeon where we can study our mice that lack PRDM16, so they lack functional brown fat, uh, do bariatric surgery on these animals after making them obese on a high calorie diet, and see whether some of the benefits of bariatric surgery are lost in the absence of brown fat. There are several questions that have come in uh, about uh, diet. And uh, one of them is the uh, uh, frequently uh, asked question of uh, what, is, what is the magic in uh, low carb diets? Why, why do they uh, seem to suppress appetite so effectively? Yeah, so um, I'm not sure that I have a, a perfect answer, but I think the general thought is that with low carbohydrate diets, or at least diets low in simple carbohydrates, there's less dramatic fluxes in blood glucose and insulin levels. And so the nutrients are taken up in a more slow fashion, and that may then result in less of a strong uh, stimulus to eat more. Um, in terms of the work I showed you today, something that many people have asked is, are there certain diets, foods, times of eating, like time-restricted feeding, that might be associated with activation of brown fat? And those are all great questions, but have not been addressed yet. Uh, another question has come in of uh, that people often become more sensitive to cold as they age. Does this relate to uh, brown fat? Uh, it certainly may. Uh, we, we, we know that there's at least circumstantial evidence. So we know that with aging, brown fat um, activity goes down. And that one would predict that might lead to increased cold sensitivity. So it's, it's certainly a possibility. So from your previous comment, uh, one might speculate that uh, cryotherapy as a weight loss uh, mechanism uh, might not be an effective uh, way to uh, lose weight because you would increase uh, the di the, your caloric intake to uh, supply the brown fat uh, to the ability to burn energy. Do you have uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, so that would be my prediction, but I'm not sure that it's actually been done. What has been done though is there have been small studies and keep in mind these are small studies just because of our limitations and how one can image and detect brown fat. But one that I think is especially provocative is a study in which a small number of men with type two diabetes uh, enrolled in a study in which they spent uh, about a month in a clinical research unit and each week the temperature was changed. And so what they found was that when the temperature was lowered to modest cool, roughly 64 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, measures of insulin sensitivity improved. And when they then raised the temperature for a week, those benefits went away. And with that, imaging studies showed activation of brown fat and then uh, disappearance of that activation. There were no effects on body weight in that study, although that wasn't the purpose of the study, but there was an effect on insulin sensitivity. Interesting. Uh, last question, as uh, we think about uh, the treatment for type two diabetes uh, and its evolution over the last decade, uh, where are we now in terms of uh, how uh, patients with type two diabetes ought to be best treated? Yeah, so I am, um, a cardiologist, so take this for a, for a, with a grain of salt, but um, I think a lot about diabetes because it's related to the heart problems that I treat in my, in my research. And there are a large number of drugs now on the market for type two diabetes. Um, and there are certainly more options now than there have been at any other time. Uh, many of these drugs do come with side effects. And so some of these drugs lead to um, weight gain. Um, but I, I think there are a lot of great options, especially when used in combination. 
And another thing that's changed over the past 10 to 20 years is that the requirement for study design has changed. So it used to be in the past that diabetes drugs could be approved simply by demonstrating that they lower blood glucose and improve diabetes control. But with the concern that some of these drugs might actually be associated with concerning cardiovascular side effects, there's now a requirement that in order to get approved, these drugs also need to at least show that they're not associated with cardiovascular harm, a harm signal. And some of the newer generations of these drugs uh, actually have been found not only not to have a signal for harm, but to actually protect against cardiovascular complications. And I think these classes of drugs are really offering tremendous excitement for the treatment of type 2 diabetes going forward. Terrific. Well, Paul, thank you so much for a very informative uh, discussion and a great presentation on brown fat. I think it's time uh, for us to close our discussion now. So I, again, want to thank Paul for a very illuminating discussion. And I also want to thank all of you for participating today. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. And thank you as well for your incredible generosity. I hope you'll continue your support of our many research initiatives. More information about how to contribute to Rockefeller can be found on our website. All of us here at Rockefeller hope that you will stay safe and be healthy. Thank you very much for participating this afternoon. I wish you all a good evening.